Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church, the beginning of summer at TPC. How many are you excited for summertime? It's hot and humid outside. Summer has fully arrived. And I'm so glad to see you guys here at church today. If we've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name is Landon, and my wife Kelly and I pastor this great church, and we're honored that you would be here today. Um, and we're, we're excited about what God's doing in your life, what he's doing in your children's lives, and, and we're excited to get to know you and meet you, and we'd love to shake your hand after service. If you're here for the very first time, a big welcome to you. Church, say hello to those that are with us for the very first time. Glad to have you here today. Inside your worship guide that you received from the beautiful smiling faces as you walked in uh, the worship center entrance, inside that worship guide is a connection card. And Kelly and I would love to just send you a letter, tell you thank you for coming and offer you some next step opportunities. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind filling that out sometime before the end of the service and at the very end of service after the benediction, those same beautiful smiling faces will be at the door with some buckets to receive those cards from you after our response time, after the message. Let's jump into what God has for us today. Brand new series starting today called Scent. And every summer we go into what, what we kind of think of as summer school. Every summer we take a deep dive into a topic or a book of the Bible. And, to, and this summer we're diving into how to live a life that invites other people to know Jesus. And we're using... Um, a, a wonderful resource called Scent. Uh, in this book, they'll have the QR code up on the screen for you. Every one of our small groups <laughs> is following this book this summer for the eight-week summer semester of small groups. We'd love for you to buy that copy of your book, and it's on Amazon Prime. It'll get to your house probably tomorrow since the Amazon distribution center is across the highway. So it'll get to your house really, really quick. And go ahead and buy this. It's a quick read. It's super thin. Uh, you can read at least one chapter about every five minutes. It's a quick read, uh, easy to follow, but it's got powerful content inside. So we'd love for everyone to have a copy, whether you're able to be in a summer small group or not. Um, but even if you're going out of town and you've got a couple of trips, get in a small group anyway and just be there when you can. The roster is live today, so small groups are open today, this week. They run all through June and July, so get in a small group. You will not regret it. And this series is not just about evangelism. It's not, that, that already sounds like we just can't do it. You're like, I don't, I'm not an evangelist. No, 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 this series is about finding joy through your own relationship with Jesus and how you begin to live that out in a life full of purpose because you know your identity as a son or daughter of God and how we can take that and show it to other people. That's, this series is all about that. We just wrapped up our series called Perfectly Designed where we laser focused on God's perfect design because God is the only designer and how his design differs from the false substitution and lies that we live in and see every day. Now, guess what? Your neighbors were not here for that series. So they need that same information. They need that same redirection. They need that truth. And the only way to do that is if the people that live next to them talk to them. I don't know about you, but we've got some neighbors that they actually have clean garages, so cars go in there. I know it's weird, right? Um, and they, they park in their garage, they leave out of the garage. It was about five years before Kelly and I knew what our neighbors even looked like. We, did, we didn't really know. Um, but it, it, we all live in these little subdivided neighborhoods, and we've got privacy fences and, and houses for our cars, and we don't really know our, our neighbors or who lives around us. But guess what? These people in your life and these friends in your life, your family, they need the same Jesus you know so that they can finally rest in his perfect design. And that's what this series is for. It's following the uh, perfectly designed series. And we're using the book Scent, and it's going to equip you this summer on how to do just that. And we're going to talk about some important things today, but we're going to get really practical. Perfectly designed was about 30,000 feet. The Scent series is about 1,000 feet. It's going to get really practical. But today, all I want to do is set up the series, because by the end of the summer, it's our hope and our prayer that you will feel confident, not that your personality will change. God made you that way on purpose, but that in how God created you, that you will feel confident to share your story and your purpose in life with another person. And we believe that this series will reshape the way you think 
and, and will help you um, not just lead other people to Jesus, but be the best walking Bible they've ever read. I understand and that a lot of us readily identify uh, with being able to, to talk to people. And it's easy for, for you uh, and your personality is wired that way. And I know it might be a little bit of a shock, but that's not me. That's my wife. Kelly is friends with everyone. I mean, when I joined Orange Theory, I was there for like a year before anyone even knew I was at Orange Theory or before the head coach even knew my name. Kelly joined Orange Theory and she had been going for four weeks and, and I walked in, they're like, where's Kelly? I'm like, why do y'all know her? And I'm like, I've been coming here a year. And the head coach goes, you have? I'm like, oh, come on. And it's like, but there, it's, a, it's a natural thing that she has. The most talking I do in a week is up here on the platform for the most part. And it's just not a natural thing for me to do that. I mean, when I go to HEB, I'm like a power walker at a mall. I mean, I'm in, I go straight to the ribeyes because it's the only section that matters. And then I leave. And it's like there's these... I'm, I'm in and I'm out, but, you know, there's certain personalities that walk in and they're like, how many friends can I make today? So how many of you are like that? You're the extrovert. You love making friends. Gwen, your hand shot up fast, girl. Now, how many of you are like me? I'm in and out. Don't want to. Wow. A lot more introverts this service. All the extroverts were first service. All right. So, so man, we're, we're talking the same language. I totally understand. But here is the deal. God is not trying to just change your personality. He doesn't even want to do that. He made you that way. We're talking about something much deeper, something much more beautiful. And, and wouldn't it be interesting if that God today brought you to the Purpose Church on purpose, knowing that you were created on purpose for a purpose and perfectly designed, and may I be bold enough to even say that every single one of you in this room, I am going to be able to share with you from the word of God today what your purpose in life is. Well, Landon, you don't know me. I don't need, need to know that right now in this moment because the number one question everybody asks is, well, why am I here? Why am I breathing? What is my purpose in life? And I believe today you're going to leave here with some excitement and some hope in your soul because God is going to speak directly to that question of what is my purpose. Are you ready? You ready to dive in? As disciples of Jesus, you and I are sent people. Everybody say sent now, here's our bottom line thesis for this series. Put it up on the screen. Let's all read it together. One, two, ready, read. Saved equals sent. Now, come on, beat the first service. Say it out loud. Ready, one, two, ready, read. Saved equals sent. Saved equals sent. Well, Landon, there's got to be like some italics, like a little caveat. Like saved equals sent unless you're a prayer warrior and you hide in a closet and let all the other people talk to people. No, 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 no. Saved equals sent. It's hard for me to stomach because I don't like that part. When I go to an airport, I'm the guy that wears five different kinds of headphones. It's like the universal signal of go away. Where, who's with me? You're like reading five books. you got big headphones on. The little earbuds don't do because people don't see all those. you got to get the big honking Sony so they know I don't want to talk to you. Noise canceling, people canceling headphones. I just go, I get my stuff down, I go, and, 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 but can I tell you something? Like that has eliminated me from very specific situations that God might have put me in. Now, I'm all about some good noise-canceling headphones on an airplane. What I am telling you is I wonder if God might challenge us today to open our eyes and be more aware. Because if you're saved, you're sent. Theologically speaking, you are a sent person. Well, Landon, no. I mean, I come to church and like I serve and like, but like you guys, like y'all are the sent ones. No, no, no. Actually, biblically speaking, if you look at New Testament theology, it says that leaders of the church are the equippers and coaches of the sent ones. Doesn't, you know, that doesn't exclude Kelly and I from sharing Jesus with people at our HOA pool, but it does challenge you. Like you are a sent person. And it's a beautiful thing. It's not something to be scared of or worried about. God's not going to put you in situations that, that are going to completely crush you. Like he is leading that whole thing. He's just needing you to take a step in the natural and he will meet it supernaturally. But I got to be honest, like I didn't understand that for a very long time. And it's a little embarrassing. You know, earlier on in my life with Jesus, like I just learned to play the drums, piano, guitar, whatever. It's like, I'll do, I'll do all the stuff up here, but man, don't make me talk to an unsaved person. 
That's scary. Like, I'll sing all day long in front of as big of a crowd as you want. I'll preach to people, but don't put me in a room one-on-one with somebody who doesn't know Jesus because they might not like it. Like, your heart's already sinking. Your heart's already getting freaked out, wondering, what is, like, I, I came to church on the wrong day. Like, I, I, I don't want to talk to unsaved people. Like, no, 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 no. Like, we're going to talk about that here for a minute. There was a considerable amount of fear in my life, and I would clam up. Even today, it's a choice, a conscious choice of mine to engage in conversations. It's always been more natural for, for Kelly and some of you guys to, to have those conversations, and small talk is a gift for you, and what a gift. I envy that gift, desire that gift. But for others of us, you know, God desires to use us, but guess what? There are no personality caveats in the Great Commission. Trusting that God is the one who sends the right people to you at the God-appointed time that he wants you to speak up and speak to and then walking through those doors as they're, as they're presented to you is our responsibility. Have you ever had that nagging feeling where you got in the car and you just knew you missed it? You're like, I was supposed to talk to that person and I, I didn't do it. I was supposed to invite that person to Jesus and, and I didn't do it. It took a long time for me to, to, to get this. Even um, the, the family was here in the first service, and, and our kids uh, play baseball at BVYA, the, the Buffalo Valley Youth Association, the Little League here in the shirts area. Our church sponsors the Little League, and we've got, like, a big sign on one of the backstops. And, 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 you know, you would think, well, the pastors are there, and the Purpose Church logo is there. Surely they'd be like, hey, everyone, welcome to BVYA, glad we get to, no, no, I walk by and I'm like, what's up? That's our logo, what's up? You know, it's like Kelly's like snack mom and she's like, hey, everybody, like bringing the party. And I'm just like, sit down, get my chair out and watch the game. And, and, and I remember sitting there and someone sat right next to me. I mean, like, because it got a little crowded. I mean, we're talking six inches. They set their, uh, their lawn chair out and they'd already made some small talk because I was wearing a cowboy shirt and they were Seahawks fans and I was like, sucks to be you. And they were like, well, you know, I was like, so we had like this funny conversation and, I, and then I let it die. I let the conversation die. I was kind of hoping it would die because I just want to watch the game, you know, and don't talk to me. Y'all are judging me, but your turn's coming. So I was sitting there <laughs> and then I began to overhear this conversation that she was having with a family member. I began to drop some eaves. Eavesdrop. <laughs> Keith's like, oh, God. Yeah, I was like, and I was like, hey, I'm like, God, what do you, I was like, let me just try this out. God, why did you put this person right next to me to talk so loudly that I can hear them in the middle of a baseball game? But it wasn't that they were talking loudly. It was just that I was supposed to hear the conversation. The conversation was all about like being at a church and being hurt and wounded because when they left, no one knew they were gone for weeks church half the size of ours and they just felt lost and hurt people they had walked with for a decade guess what backstop we were sitting in front of the one with the church logo on it and I was like God what are you doing so I mustered up the courage the whole game it took me nine innings (laughs) and y'all know how boring baseball can be nine innings to muster up this courage and then after the game I thought I had lost my opportunity and my flesh was like oh thank God you dodged a bullet kiker and then here they come around the backstop I'm like why (laughs) so here they come around the backstop and we're walking face to face I mean it's like a knight's tale we're jousting spiritually they just don't know (laughs) we come face to face and I'm like hey I don't know your name and you don't know mine and this might be a little weird that's how I started it I said, but I couldn't help but overhear your conversation that you just left your last church, you know, six months ago and you, your family is missing it and your kids are wondering what's going on and you feel deeply hurt. And I just want to tell you, like, we go to a church. In fact, it's the one with the logo behind you and her head was touching the logo because she was standing that close to the backstop. And I was like, it's actually the one you're touching. She was like, oh, I took a picture of it, sent it to her husband. And I was like, well, hey, I, we'd love for you all to come. Like, a lot of great people uh, a lot of people with kids, your kids' age, and just that place has given me a lot of life and changed my life, and I would like to invite you. So if you just want to come, let you know what service you're coming to, and we'll sit together. And at that time, my daughter walks up and says, Dad, 
And I'm like waiting for the question we get every week at the ballpark. Can I have a snow cone? You know, I'm waiting on it. And she goes, you're not going to tell her? I'm like, oh. I'm like, hey, honey, go get a snow cone. You know, here's $100 to go away. She didn't go away. And she said, you're not going to tell her that you and mom are the pastors? And I was like, thanks, baby. You're no longer my favorite. Bradley is. <laughs> and I said, I said, hey, actually, yeah, my wife and I are the pastors, but everything I just said is true. It's changed my life, and I don't know where I'd be without that church. And they came the next Sunday. They've been here ever since. Marriage conference, parenting conference, they've been here ever since. My kid was just at their kid's birthday party. I get God's going to put you in situations. He will sit a Seahawks fan <laughs> next to you. They're the worst. I'm just kidding, Brad. <laughs> the only thing worse than a Seahawks fan is an Eagles fan. Can I get an amen? Come on. <laughs> Dirty birds, all of them. But guys, it, it changes your life, and it's still not easy for me. That was like 10 weeks ago. And it's a, it's a battle for certain personalities, but can I tell you, God wants to put you, and he is bringing people sovereignly into your sphere of influence on purpose. You did not buy that house in that HOA because you liked the trim or the cabinets. He put you in that neighborhood. He put you there on purpose. He knows what kind of cabinets you like. You don't think he knows? He knows. He put you there on purpose. So to help us not only grasp the theology behind it, but to bring some feet to it and to fuel a fire in you for this, let's look at three core principles of ascent life. Three core principles of ascent life. Number one, God is always at work. Always. God doesn't take a vacation. He is always at work. And guess what? Most of the time, Kelly and I are on vacation. There's somebody that we end up talking to about Jesus on vacation. Just because we're in the mountains or we're at the beach, lots of people need Jesus on the beach. Amen to that. And God put a pastor in a chair right next to them to talk to them about Jesus. You're like, well, Landon, that just sounds awful. No, because there's certain things you don't understand. We're going to get to that in a minute. And it's going to be so good. I can't wait to share it with you, but I got these other two points. But God is always at work. We sing the songs like, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. I'm really glad our worship team has an audition process. Thank you all. Uh, oh, calm down. <laughs> calm down. But we don't believe it. Like, even when I don't see it, you're working. And then we go to work and we're like, I never stop. I'll never stop. Even when I don't see it, you're working. We're at church, and we're like, and then we go to HEB. I'll never stop. I'll never stop. No, no, no. He's always working. And it may not feel like it or seem like it, but people who understand that saved equals sent know that there is something going on you don't see that's supernatural, and God is orchestrating things to bring you into situations to bring life to someone else. That's number one. Principle number two. God uses people to lead others to Jesus. He uses people. He uses you. Once we believe and trust that God is always at work, then it's easy for us, easier for us to understand, well, God's always at work, then how does he do it? He does it through us. God doesn't need us, but he chose us. He chose us to bring Jesus to people. Acts 1.8 says, you will be my witnesses. Say it out loud. Witnesses. The Greek word there literally means testifier. You're my testifier. You are my testimony. You're my witness. You're my bullhorn. Your life is the greatest advertisement for me. You will be my witnesses. And notice this. Look at, uh, look at Jesus didn't give them something to do. He gave them an identity. And so before Jesus called them to do something, because we got to talk about the Great Commission here in a minute. He called them to be someone, to be something. Your, 
a witness. So we are witnesses empowered by the Holy Spirit to do good, good work. Principle number three, God continually invites us into the work of evangelism. Evangelism is just a fancy church word for telling people about how your life was changed. And maybe you're thinking, I don't know how I would tell them. We'll talk about that in a minute, but look at Matthew 28. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all of the commands I've given you. And be sure of this, I'm with you always. Now, the end of that verse, I have to preach that end of that verse to myself all the time. Like when I'm going into a conversation and I'm feeling like, you ever felt like you people can see your heart beating out of your shirt? And I'm like, okay, here we go. Here we go. Like what's going on here? Happened to me one time in the line at Walmart. It's always at Walmart. When you encounter spirits of the age. And I remember feeling that way. And I finally just asked the cashier. It was like a really grumpy dude. I could tell he was like in his 60s and he just looked mad. I said, sir, are you having a rough day? And he was like kind of teary-eyed. His wife had just died. Now imagine if I had said, these freaking cashiers at Walmart should have went to H-E-B. I'm going to tell your supervisor. Guys, come on. You get close to people, your grace goes up. And I remember before I said that, I'm like, you're with me always, you're with me always, you're with me always. Sir, I've never seen that guy again. I have, I've been to the shirts Walmart a hundred times since then. I've never seen him. But, I, but I, all I told him in that moment was like, I'll be praying for you every single day. I'm so sorry. But just know somebody that lives around here has got your back. And we go to this church if you want to come. I just wonder how many of those seeds you plant turn into a family tree's last name changing forever. You never know. The Bible says you, won't, you might not know until you get to heaven. And then Jesus is like, hey, those 15,000 people over there, it's because of that one conversation you had at Walmart. Who knows? But God is always at work. He's inviting you into this scenario, and he has commissioned you and given you authority and given you purpose in life. Well, Landon, like, what is my purpose in life, though? Why am I here? To tell your story and lead people to Jesus. Yeah, but Lana, like, come on, what is my purpose? To tell your story and to lead other people to Jesus. But come on, man, am I supposed to, like, like run an orphanage or, you know, build a rescue or, like, do this or, like, go foreign missions? No, guys, God will help you figure all of that out after you understand your purpose in life is to be a sent person into your sphere of influence. It can look like a million different things, but without that core, the methodology doesn't matter. It starts with that core. Look at Romans 10. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on Jesus to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in Jesus if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about Jesus unless you tell them? And how will anyone go tell them without being, say it out loud. Say it louder than that. This is why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring what kind of news? Good news. So if that's true, then why don't you and I emphatically wake up every day like, yes, I get to share Jesus with a bunch of strangers today. Why don't you and I wake up? I've never said that a day in my life. Why don't you and I wake up feeling that way? Well, there can be many reasons why people don't share their faith. Look at this statistic. 47% of people in church believe that it's wrong to tell other people about Jesus. Half of the American church believes that it is wrong to share their faith. It sounds like hell's perfect gag order to me. Well, that's the preacher's job. No, what is this? Little house on the prairie? Like, no. Like, it's all of our job. Like, it's 
47% of Christians believe that it's wrong to share their faith with someone else. So let me give you some reasons why we don't share our faith. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just some of the ones that have hit me first, so here they come to you. Number one, it's like the gospel isn't good news to us, so why would we tell someone else? Have you ever called someone and said, hey, hey, Jesse Skaggs, brother, what's up? I got some really exciting bad news to tell you. You've never done that, or you're a bad friend. You're like, don't do that. No, no, no. Is it good news to you? Do you remember what you've been saved from? Do you remember where your life trajectory was headed before someone who was sent by God talked to you and brought you to Jesus and then your family tree's name has been forever changed and your name is now written in the Lamb's Book of Life and hell is no longer a place you have to go or live in currently. Do you remember that? Because if you remember that, then it is good news. And if it's good news, you want to tell everybody. That's what the word gospel means. The word gospel is just a transliteration from the Greek word euangelion. Euangelion just means really stinking good news. Just amazingly good news. It's like the, oh my God, kind of news. It's not just like, hey, let me tell you about this man named Jesus. He lived a long time ago. No, no, no. It's the best news you've ever heard in your life. That's what the word gospel means. So do you and I really believe that it's good news? And then take it a step further, do you and I actually believe that people who haven't accepted Jesus will be lost and forever separated from God? If you don't believe that, then why do we need Jesus? If we don't need Jesus, then why are we here? Maybe you don't believe it's good news. Maybe you believe it's uncomfortable news. Maybe you believe it's awkward news, weird news, like a dude raising from the dead. It's kind of weird. Maybe it's judgmental news. You've seen the people on the street corner with a bullhorn and they're screaming at people. And worked in the 50s, doesn't work anymore. Maybe you actually believe it's bad news. Maybe you've believed that lie that truth is relative. See, in our lack of understanding of the truth of the gospel, in our lack as Christians of the understanding of the truth of the good news, it's easy to think those things, and I've been there too. But when you and I fully grasp the good news, that you and I don't have to earn our way to God, that, the, that our debt has been forever paid by the blood of Jesus, that you and I now get to know God personally, We would want that for everyone. But if Christianity is a list of rules and self-righteous behavior modification, lived through the lenses of your past spiritual abuse and trauma, then why would you share that with anyone? You wouldn't. So if the gospel is good news, then you want to share it. But it's the number one reason why people don't share it because they don't believe it's good news. Because they're not living an abundant life themselves. Number two, lack of compassion for non-believers. They just drive you nuts. They drive you crazy. You fear that they're ruining our country. And you know more of, uh, about what the news cycle says about these people than what God says about these people. The Bible doesn't say that we were fearfully and wonderfully made when we go to church. It says that everyone was knit together in their mother's womb, that God knows every hair on their head and his heart is completely broken, that they are that lost. And this one's hard for me because when you start having kids, you see the people that are non-believers forcing things on your children. And it's hard. It's something that we have to cultivate. And the only way to cultivate compassion for people who don't know God is to spend time with God. And his heart becomes your heart and his thoughts become your thoughts and you begin to see people like sheep without a shepherd, not an enemy to be defeated. So my suggestion to you is to step into their lives, to get close to someone, the grace rises. When you get closer to that person, your grace begins to increase for them and their situation. So when you feel like you wanna be mad at them and run away, 
I'm challenging you to do what is so hard for me is to step closer to them. Instead of run, introduce yourself. See what God does there. Number three, we are afraid of it being awkward or confrontational or just downright scary. And it might be all of those three things. I'm not saying it won't be. I'm not saying like when you talk to somebody that an angel of the Lord floats down and brings peace to the non-believer. And they're like, oh, thank you for saving my soul. No one's ever said that to me. It'll be a little awkward. But that's okay. That's okay. Just know that it's going to be there. But if you have some tools in your tool belt, that really helps with those moments. Okay, so get the book. We don't get any, you know, back end payment for this book. It's just, you need it. It's really good. Number four, you don't know how to do it. You're like, you're like do I buy a bunch of tracks? Like, do you remember what tracks were? And there was a thing called chick tracks. I mean, is anybody old school Baptist and you remember chick tracks? And you like, and it had like all these pictures and the devil was really creepy looking and Jesus was like Swedish. And it was like all these, and you like put them in your pocket and, 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 and you're like, hey, do you know you're destined for hell unless you know Jesus? Boom, praise the Lord. And you walk away. It doesn't work anymore. No, like that would be super weird. You should not do that. However, how do you do it? The number one way to do it is to tell your story. That's what culture loves right now. It's your truth, right? So tell them your truth. They just don't know that it's the truth yet. But start with telling them what God did for you. That's how you do it. Didn't y'all love the five on seven last week? Five communicators in seven minutes. They did an incredible job. And I remember sitting here thinking, they're telling their story. And I got saved again. I mean, it was such a good, good day. Number five, we're unsure of how to communicate that story. So you need some tools. You need some help. But sharing your story is powerful. It's powerful. Nobody's wanting you to teach them Greek and Hebrew. No one cares. Nobody wants to know if our church is pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. You don't even know what I'm talking about. They don't want to know. They just know you're tribbing. They don't know anything else. They want to know what it do for you. Don't come talk to me about this Jesus dude I've never seen with your life looking like that. Don't come talk to me about this Jesus thing if you're going to treat me like I'm less than you. Like, no, when you get close to people, your heart breaks like Jesus. And the only people that hated Jesus were the religious ones. So if your heart breaks for people, they'll see it. They'll feel it. And I just remember what it did for me when God took a very confused and scared and depressed young man and took him out of darkness and sin and release joy and peace that changes how you see people so know your story because here's the deal embodied truth is stronger than emotion or personality when that truth gets embodied if the bible's all up here for you then that's not stronger that's just knowledge it's got to drop 18 inches it's got to go here it's got to be realized. It's got to be embodied. And when that truth is embodied, it changes how you approach people. Now, you're not going to turn into a new person. Your personality is not going to change. But a brand new spiritual person now sees people through the eyes of Jesus. And it's stronger than uh, a meek personality or an introverted approach. Sharing your faith not, on, not, not only then becomes a yes, it is a conviction. The Holy Spirit brings those moments to you. So sent is now who you are. You are a sent person because saved equals sent. So if saved equals sent, you're a sent person. We are sent people. We aren't church attenders or simply believers. We are found people finding people. We are saved people being sent to help bring salvation and save other people. We are changed people bringing about life change to others. And it's not a duty that's reserved for the ordained or those on the platform. It's the role of every disciple of Christ. When you're saved, you're sent. I want to invite every one of you to come to Growth Track next week. 
It's at the church office. The church has about a 4,200 square foot like operations center on 1518. The staff office out of there, and it's used a lot. I mean, next-gen groups, youth group, worship rehearsal, uh, other nonprofits use it um, on weeknights, and it's a, it's a busy deal. In fact, the thing that I have told our staff and I've told every developer is, like, I want our buildings to have the highest electric bill shirts has ever seen because it is open all day, every day. And we're already making good on that promise with this little office complex. I want you guys to come see it and be a part of it and see what God's doing. And yeah, we own the land on the interstate and that was a miracle, praise God. But right now while we're having church in this school and we're operating out of that operation center, the ministry training center, come and see how God is sending you. That's what growth track is. Like show up, we'll have a good meal, your kids will eat, your kids will have their own party going on the other side of the building. And you'll, you'll be in, in room number one. We'll all be there together. And we're talking through, why did God bring all of us strangers into an elementary school cafeteria? Why did he do that? And it's incredible, the answer. We want you to come to Growth Track and find that out and see what these next steps are for your life spiritually. Because once you're saved, you are sent. And we want to help walk you through that. So go ahead and sign up. Let us know you're coming so we can make sure we got enough food for everybody. And I get it. There's, there can be some hesitation. The Holy Spirit will empower you every step of the way. I'm going to ask the ushers to come down and pass out this card to you. And I want you to think about the people in your life. And zone it down to five. Think about five specific people in your life. And the ones that you don't want to write down are the ones you need to write down. And it doesn't make you responsible for them. There there is no guilt trip coming or anything like that. Here's what we're doing. Who has God sovereignly placed you next door to? Who has God placed in your life at your children's school? Write your name in the story. Like imagine if God said, hey, I'm really wanting to reach the people of Shirts, Cibolo, Selma, New Braunfels, Live Oak, Marion, Santa Clara, Universal City. And I really felt like you'd be able to do it. I really felt like Keith was supposed to be a part of that. I really felt like Alexis is supposed to be a part of that really feel like you're supposed to be a part of that. And just think through that for a minute that God has handpicked you to be here at this moment in this time in this growing area of the city because there are people moving next door to you that Jesus wants you to talk to. Write their names down. They're in response time. Begin to think of, you might already know who they are. But our hope and courage To talk to them does not come from personality or gifting. It comes from the reality that we have an awesome God who saved us and sent us. So think about those five people. And during response time, you're going to write their names down. And all we're going to do, keep this where you'll see it every day. Like tape it to your bathroom mirror or put it over your speedometer. (laughs) Or don't do that. Just put it somewhere where you'll see it all the time. Think about them every day. And every time you see that card, just pray a quick little 10-second prayer. God, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would reveal himself to these people. And watch God begin to change everything about their life. It might take a while, might be fast, might be long, I don't know. That's up to God. But just commit to pray for them every day. And ask God to give you ways to share the best news of your life with them. Because saved equals sent. I'm going to ask the band to come up and help me end the service today. We end our service every Sunday with what we call response time. Uh, what the pastors do up here every Sunday is, is not a performance. It's equipping. It's, it's, it's invitation. And so we end our service every Sunday with response time. Now, what does that mean? That means that the prayer team is going to come down. Go ahead and come down, prayer team, while I'm talking about it. Prayer team is going to come down. They're going to stand right here in front of these steps. And there are two tables here with communion on it. 
and they'll have gloves on. And what these communion elements will be is they'll rip the bread off and they'll dip it in the juice and hand it to you. And they'll tell you your sins are forgiven. It's a reminder that you are saved. And then you're sent after that. And these prayer partners want to pray a beautiful prayer over your life. No matter what you're going through, they are in your corner to pray over you and pray destiny over you. And here's three things I want you to think about for this response time. Now, you can, they'll pray with you about anything you want. If it's physical healing, it, uh, something with your marriage, whatever, they, finances, they will pray for whatever you, you need prayer for. But for the, uh, the sermon content, here's three thoughts. Preach the gospel to yourself. Where do you need forgiveness of sin? You know what that is. And God wants to cover that sin with the blood of Jesus. And you can come down today and confess that. The Bible says we confess our sins one to another so that we may be whole and free. God forgives sin, but freedom comes through people. You got to tell somebody because you're only sick as your secrets. So allow someone to speak. It's scary, right? This is Christianity, though. This is, this is Jesus. This is that's what the church is for. This is, why, this is why we're here, is to help each other move forward. So push past that initial resistance and allow freedom to come. It'll be so beautiful. And if you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, walk down here in the natural, and he will supernaturally meet you at this altar. Tell them, I want to make Jesus my Lord and Savior. They will pray the prayer of faith with you, and you will leave here a saved and sent person. Allow them to pray that over you. The second thought I want you to have is ask God to soften your heart towards those that need the good news. Like if you're pent up and frustrated, turn the news off and start reading the Bible. Because the news will just make you hate people. Just turn it off and allow God to break your heart for these people. And, and allow God to help you see them the way he sees them. So come and pray with a prayer partner and, and they will pray uh, that over you as well. And then the last one is ask God to begin to put you in situations with people who need the good news. It's the scariest prayer of all today. But come down and tell these prayer partners, I want you to pray a prayer of courage over me and I want God to put me in situations for the next seven days that people need the best news I've ever gotten. And watch how God works. And watch how God puts you in those situations. But come and receive an impartation of courage and boldness. You don't have to have all the perfect words to say. If God can use a stutterer like Moses and talk through a donkey, he can talk through you. I'm not making any connections there. But allow God to speak. Everyone stand to your feet today. Saved equals what? Sent. Lord Jesus, in this moment, we ask for you to come and reveal yourself. You already have today, but God, give all these beautiful people courage and boldness to step into this new life as a sent person. And God, we pray that you, that we as the church would be the ones that are sent out to help build your church. Use us. Use us, Lord. God, thank you for our salvation. Come on, somebody say that out loud. God, thank you for my salvation. Thank you for saving me from what I did, from what I couldn't pay for myself. Thank you for not giving me what I deserved. But thank you for your grace and thank you for your mercy. And God, may that be fuel for me to reach other people. So God, birth in me a passion to share the good news because I am saved. And that means I am sent in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. The altars are now open. They're going to sing through a song. While they're singing, come get prayer, take communion, and we'll come up and end the service here shortly.